coming up on our newscast. North Korea reportedly test fired two long range cruise missiles under the supervision of the regime's leader. The reported results of the launch indicate the projectiles are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Kyiv is hit by drone strikes. According to Ukraine's top office, critical infrastructure facilities were struck and there were no reports of immediate casualties. The nation's central bank's record rate hike led to a noticeable decline in borrowing and a spike in saving. The imbalance in rates between Seoul and Washington led to a massive outflow of foreign investment. Hello and welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with the top story at the Sauer. North Korea's state media reports the regime test fired two long range cruise missiles on Wednesday, with its leader personally supervising the launches. Seoul's military detected the projectiles and is maintaining strong defense readiness with Washington. Pei Yunji starts us off. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Wednesday reportedly oversaw the test firing of two long-range strategic cruise missiles. The North State media said Thursday morning that the missiles flew for almost three hours and successfully hit a target some 2,000 kilometers away, adding that the missile tests were meant to send a clear warning to the regime's enemies. The Korean Central News Agency also said the test was to check the reliability and war-fighting efficiency of the weapons already deployed to its army units in charge of tactical nukes, indicating that the cruise missiles can carry nuclear weapons. This is the first time that the North has publicly announced that it tested long-range cruise missiles carrying tactical nukes. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said it detected the missiles as soon as they were launched and said it's currently analyzing the details. North Korea launched two cruise missiles toward the West Sea at 2 a.m. on Wednesday from the Gaecheon area of Pyongan-Namdo province. Our military was aware of the situation and were maintaining a strong defense readiness in cooperation with the U.S. North Korea has been developing cruise missiles that can fly at low altitudes and maneuver in a way that can better evade missile defenses. As for the missile's range, it's long enough to hit Japan. Cruise missiles are relatively slow, so they can be intercepted. But a lot of countries are still concerned about these missiles because they can hit targets much more precisely than ballistic missiles. Following the North missile test, Japan's defense minister said Thursday that the regime has most likely developed miniaturized nuclear warheads, small enough to be carried by medium-range ballistic missiles. Regarding the ballistic missiles that have a range that could include Japan, it is likely that they have already achieved the capability of miniaturizing and mounting nuclear warheads on those missiles for an attack. The latest missile launches come amid escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, as South Korea and U.S. officials have said the North appears to have completed all necessary preparations to conduct a nuclear test for the first time in five years. Hyunji, Arirang News. Top military officers of Seoul, Washington and Tokyo will meet in the U.S. Likely topics include discussing ways to counter evolving North Korean threats. JCS Chair Kim sung yeon will travel to the States for talks with his American and Japanese counterparts. The meeting is set to take place next Thursday, U.S. local time. The three officials last met in March in Hawaii. They discussed ways to enhance trilateral defense cooperation and issues related to Pyongyang, including its ICBM launch back then. In the third quarter of this year, 23 North Koreans defected to the South. A unification ministry official told reporters that 14 males and 9 females crossed over. So far in 2022, the total adds up to 42. A 13 percent on-year drop from 48 or 29 males and 19 females. The number of defectors were greatly reduced earlier this year due to prolonged cross-border restrictions brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Elsewhere around the world, Ukrainian officials say Russia attacked multiple cities. The capital was hit by the so-called kamikaze drones. This followed the passage of a resolution by the UNGA calling Moscow's annexation illegal. Kim Jong-sil brings the updates. Ukrainian presidential office said on Thursday in a telegram post that critical infrastructure facilities in the capital, Kyiv, were under attack by what it called kamikaze drones. 
Reuters quoted the governor of the Kyiv region, Oleksiy Kuliba, who said preliminary information indicated that the drones were made by Iran, although Iran denies supplying them to Russia. The general staff of Ukraine's armed forces said on Thursday that Russian missiles pounded more than 40 Ukrainian cities and towns in the past 24 hours. The recent attacks comes after a U.N. General Assembly resolution passed by a large majority on Wednesday. 143 member states, or three-quarters of the total, voted in favor. There were 35 abstentions and five voted against it. Those five members were Belarus, North Korea, Nicaragua, Russia and Syria. The vote in the UN was a clear condemnation of the illegal annexation of Ukrainian territories and a clear call on Russia, President Putin, to uh, reverse these decisions and to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Member states welcomed the result. I was not surprised, but I was delighted. Uh, to see uh, the numbers. And it's a strong, strong signal to the world and to Russia that they cannot intimidate the world. This is a message to Russia. It's a message from the world that they need to cease their aggression against Ukraine. The resolution called on countries not to recognize the four regions of Ukraine that Russia has claimed following widely denounced referendums held in late September. Kim Jong-sil. Arirang News. Shifting our focus to the U.S. now, in its National Security Strategy report, the Biden administration highlighted China as America's main global competitor and biggest geopolitical challenge, distinguishing it qualitatively from the threats posed by Russia. On North Korea, Washington plans to strengthen extended deterrence. Shin Ayong provides a closer look. America's most consequential geopolitical challenge. This is how the Biden administration has described China in an official report outlining its security and foreign policy objectives, which was released on Wednesday. Biden's national security strategy, a Congress-mandated document, was planned to be delivered in January, but that was put on hold due to the war in Ukraine. In the latest security plan, the U.S. defined the strategic threats that the country is facing in two categories. Competition with major powers like China and global challenges like climate change, the pandemic and inflation. In order to win in its competition with China, the U.S. says it will continue to enhance and expand its alliances while bolstering investments in underlying sources and tools of American power and influence. Along with China-related issues, the strategy also mentioned constraining the threat from Russia as another priority, but differentiated between the two. It said Russia poses an immediate threat to international society due to its ongoing war, while saying China is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order as well as the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to advance that objective. The U.S. also reaffirmed its commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through diplomacy, vowing to bolster extended deterrence against North Korea to rein in missile threats. North Korea was mentioned three times in the latest strategy document compared to 17 times in the previous administration's NSS report. Meanwhile, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. has decided to strengthen cooperation with other countries comprehensively to deal with global challenges. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. President Yoon Suk-yeol will meet with his German counterpart early next month. Frank-Walter Steinmeier is visiting Seoul for three days from November 3rd. The summit is set for the 4th. Topics will include cooperation on the global supply chain, energy and other economic security issues, as well as security on the Korean Peninsula. Citing Germany as a key player in Europe that shares common values with South Korea, the top office expects the meeting will serve as a chance to bolster bilateral ties. The two countries are set to celebrate 140 years of diplomatic relations next year. It's the first time in four years a German president is visiting Korea. Seoul's finance chief agreed with the central bank's decision on interest rates with a hike of 50 basis points in response to inflation and the strong U.S. dollar. The policy rate is now at 3% for the first time in about a decade. 
Cho Kyung, who is on a trip to Washington for a G20 meeting, told reporters that the hike was necessary because taming inflation is the country's number one task right now. The minister added the government's view is no different from that of the BOK. He pointed out if rates were not raised to deal with the once depreciation, the instability in the FX market would continue. The Bank of Korea is raising rates at an unprecedented pace has led to a noticeable decline in borrowing and an increase in saving. The imbalance in rates between Seoul and Washington led to over $1.5 billion in foreign investment outflow. Here's Chen min -jung with a breakdown of the digits. South Korea's benchmark interest rate has been raised for the fifth consecutive time. And following the continuous hikes, more people are saving their money in bank accounts to benefit from the higher rates. According to the Bank of Korea, deposits as of September stood at 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars. The figure increased significantly last month, mainly due to more people locking money in time deposits, which posted a rise of $22 billion in September alone. This is the largest monthly increase since data was first compiled in 2002. The Bank of Korea says the high growth was due to an inflow of household and corporate funds following the rise in interest rates. However, the tightened monetary policy has also led to fewer people borrowing money. The central bank's data show that household loans amounted to $741 billion as of September, following a monthly drop of nearly $840 million. On top of this, foreign investors withdrew a great deal of money from the domestic stock market last month. According to the BOK, the net outflow of foreign investment was logged at $1.6 billion in September. This comes in contrast with the previous month as funds posted a net inflow of $3 billion. The central bank attributed the drop to rising concerns over aggressive monetary policies in major economies, as well as the sharp depreciation of the Korean currency against the U.S. dollar. Choi min -dong, Arirang News. South Korea is increasing its mandate of biodiesel blending with regular diesel to 8% by 2030, up from its previous target of 5% as part of efforts to promote biofuels or fuel derived from biomass such as plant or animal waste. This is part of the Energy Ministry's blueprint to promote biofuels, announced during a meeting with related industry insiders. Currently, the country mandates biodiesels to be blended at an average share of 3.5% in diesel. The government also plans to support developing biofuel tech to foster the industry and help gain competitiveness on the global stage. Meeting with the leaders of the Semaul movement, an initiative that helped modernize the rural Korean economy in the 1970s, President Yoon called for efforts to expand the nation's contributions to global development. Speaking at the convention on Thursday, he said the same model could be used in other countries too. The South Korean leader revisited his UN speech last month to expand the nation's contribution to the global community as one of the top 10 global economic powers based on the spirit of freedom and solidarity. The Semal movement's basic principles have been passed on to some 63,000 people around the world, including community leaders and regional government officials. The first edition of the International Union for Conservation of Nature Leaders Forum begins. Participants from around the world come together to discuss and devise necessary solutions. Among the key topics, a new system to track contributions towards a greener global economy. Ideon takes us there. A nature-positive society where nature is restored and regenerated. That's what the global community has been aiming for. And South Korea's southernmost island of Jeju is hosting the first edition of the International Union for Conservation of Nature Leaders Forum. Organized by the IUCN and South Korea's Ministry of Environment, the three-day event kicked off on Thursday under the theme of building nature-positive economies and society. It serves as a platform for discussions on eco-friendly policies in the agriculture and finance sectors. In the opening ceremony, South Korea's Minister of Environment highlighted the importance of including biodiversity in business decisions and urged leaders to step up for sustainability amid global uncertainties. To do this, the president of IUCN proposed a nature-positive approach. The IUCN is proposing a nature-positive approach. This approach will enable the emerging of a more precise global picture 
of the true extent of nature loss, the efforts needed to overcome it, and to be able to track the collective contributions of the private sector, of civil societies, and of governments globally. And to be able to also align those efforts. According to IUCN, this system will allow the assessment and tracking of nature positive contributions from both the public and private sectors. The aim is to provide potential investors with the data they need. The way it is measured, um, it's, uh, it depends on the different offers. There will be, I imagine, different tools available. One of them, the one that IUCN proposes. The tools that are the more scientifically rooted, but at the same time easy to use, that deliver clear results, will be the one that will, in the long run, take over. Leaders and changemakers from a variety of sectors will discuss innovative solution to biodiversity loss and climate change at the IUCN Leaders Forum 2022 in an effort to foster a more nature-positive community. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News, Jeju. Moving on to other stories now, many scientists say climate change is causing massive damage around the world, especially to the agricultural sector. In response, local researchers are developing water management technologies to be better prepared against droughts and flooding. Jung Eun-ju shed slide on the system. This tractor is installing a drain pipe and burying rice holes 50 centimeters into the ground. By installing a drainage system in this way, paddy fields with lots of water can be turned into normal fields, and flooding or flood damage can be prevented. Even plants like beans, which usually don't grow well in wet soil, thrive in these fields when it rains frequently as it did this summer. Without a drainage system like this, bean yields decline. Now we're able to go out into the fields without needing boots even after it's rained. It's really improved things for farming. South Korean scientists have also developed an automatic irrigation control technology. The technology supplies only the amount of water needed for crops through tubes buried in the ground. It saves water and increases water use efficiency to help overcome droughts. We've developed a smartphone app that can monitor soil moisture and groundwater levels at all times so we can check soil moisture conditions around the clock. Image analysis technology has been developed for precise water management. Sensors are used to determine the growth and moisture of crops. There's also an automatic water and pest management function. By using a near-infrared wavelength that's invisible to the human eye, we can see plant growth and determine whether or not they have enough water. As climate change causes extreme weather conditions, it is important to develop technology that ensures stable food production. This technology will enable farmers to produce the crops they need. Tong Eun-ju, Arirang News. A special ceremony is held at Changdeokgung to celebrate the autumn harvest. Visitors get to experience the traditional rice harvesting methods at the royal palace. Yi Shiu follows us this report. Nestled in the rear garden of Changdeokgung Palace in Seoul is a special pavilion named Cheongijong. The Cheongijong Pavilion is the last remaining building in the palace with a straw thatched roof. The building's circular roof symbolizes the sky, and the rectangular paddy field in front of it, the land. The field had a special purpose in the past. This is where the kings of the Joseon dynasty used to plant and harvest crops to see whether it would be a good or a bad year for farming. Growing crops in the field also helped the royals empathize with the hardships of farmers. To reenact this tradition, the Cultural Heritage Administration and the palace have jointly organized a special event. 
We organized a rice harvesting event to revive the historical and symbolic meaning of harvesting rituals performed by kings of the past. We hope that it will be an opportunity to feel how much care the kings had for the people and think about our traditional agricultural culture. The exuberant sounds of traditional farmers' music mark the beginning of the harvest. The performers, clad in colorful costumes, swing their heads and make pirouettes to the beat of drums while parading around the paddy field. And those playing the roles of farmers on the day began the long-awaited harvest. Using a sickle, they cut the rice plants at their base row by row. It's tough work, but together the group makes progress. Visitors from all around the world make sure not to miss a moment. It's very interesting to see how the rice culture is in Korea. Once harvested, the sheaves of rice are slid against rice bars and threshed in the traditional way. The threshed rice is then steamed and pounded to make rice cake or dak. The leftover stalks don't go to waste and are used to make handmade packaging for carrying chicken eggs. Participants of the event say they appreciate the rare opportunity. Yeah, no, it was definitely a lot of work, um, but it was neat to, to use like the, the hand tool and stuff. But where we're from, you know, you see lots of giant tractors and things like that, that you don't ever see anybody hand harvesting anything. So uh, it was interesting. Those wishing to take part in a future ritual at the paddy field can visit the palace next spring for a rice planting event. Lee si Arirang News. Seoul Fashion Week is back in full swing for the first time in three years. Tong Demon Design Plaza is showcasing the spring and summer collections to come. Kim Yeon Sung provides a glimpse of the coming out trends. Fashion runways are back in Seoul with all the glitz and glamour. Crowds flock to Tong Demon Design Plaza to witness the return of Seoul Fashion Week. The city's biggest fashion spectacle kicked off on Tuesday, with no more COVID social distancing rules to worry about for the first time in three years. Do you live in Seoul? No, I'm actually from um, Atlanta, and I, I came here just for this. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So you crossed borders all the way for Seoul Fashion Week? I sure did, yeah. And I love the environment, and I really love like fashion, and I like how experimental that they get here. Before I feel like in, in Korea, it's like really genderless and like unisex in general, which I really like. With the rise of K-content and Korean culture, K-fashion is also rising in popularity globally. This year, 120 buyers have come from 24 countries. And over the next five days, 33 K-fashion brands are going to present their best line of work for next year's spring and summer collection. Greedius is one of Seoul's rising fashion brands. The name fuses the words greedy and fabulous, and fitting to its name, the designer experiments with loud colors and bold prints. Greedius's designs have also been around the globe, from New York to Guangzhou. K-fashion is confidence. Once you wear Gradius, you will become confident like me. And because Gradius has a sure-footed identity, the clothes become a language. The designer has also worked with cutting-edge artificial intelligence, blurred lines between genders, and mixed retro and futuristic into one fit for her unique, fearless designs. Holy Number no. 7 is another brand that people were talking about on the first day of Fashion Week. The designers get their inspiration from the Bible. The theme of these designs is love and verses from the Bible are blended into the clothes. Fashion can influence even young kids, so we wanted our designs to be hip but also kind. Their designs also started to grab the attention of international buyers. The entry barriers to the fashion scene in the U.S. and Paris used to be really high. But now they'll reach out to us first through Instagram and ask us about setting up a showroom. A lot of people are interested in K-fashion. These two brands give a brief look into the creativity of Seoul fashion. And with Korean fashion growing its presence, designs born here will soon be strutting down the global runway. Kim Yansen, Arirang News. Typical autumn weather will prevail across the country tomorrow. Expect warm daytime highs with big contrast in daily temperatures again. In particular, places like Changsu and Seollebukdo province will see a wide gap of nearly 16 degrees. 
Drastic fluctuation in temperatures are raising the overall common cold index. The risk of catching a cold is especially high across western central regions, including this homage Pothan area. And for inland regions, dense layers of fog will build up again overnight as temperatures will be dropping significantly. Visibility is forecast to drop to below one kilometer until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Giving yourself some extra time for the morning commute would be recommended as caution is advised when driving. Partly cloudy to overcast skies are expected for the morning hours. Lows in Seoul will be starting off at 13 degrees. Daily highs in Seoul and Chuncheon will be reaching 22. Daegu and Gyeongju will be topping out at 23 degrees. Next week, a surge of cold air will settle in and temperatures will take a steep dive. Lows in the capital will be plunging to 4 degrees next Tuesday. That's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world. And that's all from us. As always, thank you for watching.